everyone, this is Mouse Gunner, and this video is the third in a series covering how pump action firearms work. The first video in the series covered the Winchester model 1897. The second video discussed the Remington 870, and this time around we will be looking at the Mossberg 500. I recommend watching the first two videos in the series before watching this video, as they both form a foundation that we will be further building upon in this video. The Mossberg 500 has been in production since the early 1960s and is seen as the main rival of the Remington 870, which it shares a number of similarities to insofar as the basic function of the action. Just like the previous two examples I've covered so far in this series, the basic functionality of the action of the Mossberg 500 can be broken down into an interaction of three main components. So the first component we will be taking a look at is the action bar, which we have highlighted here. And the action bar is directly attached to the forend, so as the user drives the forend to the rear, so too will the action bar be driven to the rear. The Mossberg 500, like the Remington 870, has two action bars, one on each side. So you can see one here and one on the other side here. The Mossberg 500 was not originally designed to have two action bar arms. It originally had just one arm, just like the Winchester Model 1897. Now this was found unfortunately to be too fragile as the single arm could be bent or damaged under the strain of running the action. So later in the 1970s, the second arm was added on for increased durability. It took that amount of time to be implemented because Mossberg had to wait for Remington's patent covering dual action bar arms to run out. Next component we'll be looking at out of the three components is the slide. And it interacts directly with the action bars through a cutout in the action bar that a lug on the slide fits within. So as the action bar is driven to the rear, so too will the slide. And then our last component is the bolt. And within the bolt is a, a locking block. And if this is giving you deja vu with the uh, video I covered, the Remington 870, that's because the parts and how they interact with each other is pretty much exactly the same as what we saw with the Remington 870. It's mostly the dimensions that are a little bit different. And the main differences of the Mossberg 500 and the Remington 870 are actually found outside of the interaction of these three main components. But I thought I would go over it just so that we can see how similar they are and reinforce how these parts interact. Now the logging block fits up in a cutout in the barrel. Now unlike with the Remington 870 where it fit within a cutout in the barrel but also partially fit within a cutout in the receiver, the locking block on the Mossberg 500 fits entirely within the barrel. So if we come out here, you can see that the locking block doesn't extend any higher than this cutout in the barrel. This is to allow the Mossberg 500's receiver to be made out of aluminum. Aluminum is a softer metal, and the barrel itself is made out of steel. So you're having the stronger steel be the main bearing surface of the locking block, locking the bolt in place, rather than the receiver like what you see on the Remington 870. So as a result, the Remington 870 has a steel receiver and uh, is a little bit heavier than the Remington, I mean, sorry, the Mossberg 500. So as not to have an obstructed view of the interaction of the slide and the locking block, I've gone to a different viewing mode. So as the action bar is driven to the rear, it's going to take the slide with it. And as the slide comes back, this angled surface here is going to contact this angled surface here on the underside of the locking block. And as they come together, they are going to slide along each other. This is going to drive this part of the locking block down, and the locking block will pivot along this point here, which as it pivots, this end will come up, which will in turn drive this end down. And as this end is driven down, the locking block is going to fall out of this cutout on the barrel, allowing the bolt to be driven to the rear. What's going to drive it to the rear is the slide coming in and contacting the rear surface of the cutout and the inside of the bolt. So you can see that surface silhouetted here. The slide comes back, contacts that point, and starts to bring the bolt to the rear. Now that the locking block is unlocked. So as we come all the way back, we're going to have the shell ejected, and then Again, we're gonna have improperly timed parts, just like what we saw with the Remington 870 as we come forward, because we'll see all of the parts just kind of move together as one still, even though that wouldn't in reality happen. What should be happening here is that the slide should move slightly forward. 
Now it's not going to move as far forward as the Remington 870 should have moved, but what more or less is going to happen is this slope surface here is going to hit this slope surface. And just like the Remington 870, the locking block has nowhere to go. There's no cutout for it to fit up within because the receiver comes up flush with the barrel. And we can see that here. So you can see that the barrel and the receiver are flush with each other, so there is nowhere for that locking block to go outside of this cutout here in the barrel. So as a result of that, when this slope surface contacts this angled surface on the underside of the locking block, it will not drive it up. Instead, it will rest there, and at that point, the bolt will be driven forward. The bolt comes forward, and again, we don't see that. Instead, we just have this space, and the bolt is driven by no force the way this is animated. And then it's not until the locking block comes to the point where it could go up into the cutout that now the slide, which would be resting up against the slope surface, can slide along the angled surface. Now again, you can see a little bit of a sloppy animation here as the slide phases through the locking block. And then the slide is going to come up underneath the locking block and lock it in place and the cutout in the barrel. And then, just like with the Remington 870, by it being here underneath the locking block, the slide prevents the locking block from falling down into the unlocked position. The only way you can unlock the locking block is by bringing the slide back, and the only way you can do that is by acting upon the action bars. So again, pretty much identical in the overall function with what we saw in the Remington 870. It's just mostly the dimensions of the parts that is really different. Now that we've seen how similar the Mossberg 500 and the Remington 870 are when considering the basic functionality of the action, you might be wondering, in what way is the Mossberg 500 different? And it's different in pretty much every other way. And the first element of its difference that we'll examine is the action lock and the trigger group. Although the purpose of the action lock on the Mossberg 500 might be the same as the action lock found on the Remington 870, its overall design and how it achieves its function is quite a bit different. Now the job of the action lock is to physically come up and block the slide, preventing it from being driven to the rear. It can be deactivated one of two ways, just like with the action lock in the Remington 870. It can either be deactivated by pushing up on this exposed surface of the action lock here, and pushing up on that end will cause the action lock to pivot, so this end will come up and this end will come down uh, as it pivots along its axis point here. And as it pivots down on this end, it will no longer be blocking the slide. So as the user of the firearm operates the forehand and drives the action bars to the rear, the slide will come back unobstructed and the slide itself will hold the action lock down. So if the operator of the firearm were to let go of the control of the action lock on this end, it wouldn't make any difference because the slide is holding the action lock down. But once the slide moves past the action lock, it would come back up under the driving force of this return spring. For whatever reason, the program is not animating the return spring. So this is the return spring here. As you can see, it's resting here, but then for some reason it just doesn't drive down as it should pulling down on the action lock and in turn pivoting this end up and once the slide comes back forward it's going to contact this slope surface here so you have a cutout on the underside that's also sloped that's going to push the action lock back down and but again once we get to this slope surface here the return spring of the action lock will start to allow it to pivot up. It will slide along that slope surface. This time, the return spring is actually animated, and then we'll be back into the lock position. The second way to deactivate the action lock is to pull the trigger. But before we examine that, let's first examine the trigger mechanism itself. So a rearward pull of the trigger is gonna cause the trigger to pivot towards the rear on this end. And it's gonna pivot along its axis point here. So as it pivots, at the bottom part of the trigger towards the rear, it in turn is going to pivot forwards at the top. We can see that happening now. And as it pivots forward at the top, it's going to drive the connector here, which is attached to the trigger. 
And as the connector is driven forward, this hook here on the bottom edge of the connector is going to drive the sear forward, causing the sear to pivot out of contact with a notch cut into the hammer. And once that contact is broken, the hammer will drive forward. And what drives the hammer forward is this bar here, which be is being driven in turn by a spring-loaded plunger. And the bar is gonna come into a cutout in the middle of the hammer and inside this cutout there is a rounded bar that extends across this inner cutout on the hammer and there's a wrench shaped cut in the end of this bar here the driving bar that's going to push up on the rounded bar on the inside of the hammer pivoting it up and around and eventually striking the back of the firing pin, driving the firing pin into the primer and the back of the shell, igniting the shell and sending the shot down the barrel. And as this is going on, if we come out into the x-ray, we can see that the action lock has two springs that interact with it. Firstly, it has the return spring, which we've already seen interact with it. This spring is driving the action lock down on this end, which in turn brings the action lock up on this end. But we also see a second spring right here. Now, at this moment, this spring isn't actually acting upon the action lock. It's not until the hammer comes forward and a bar that goes across or a peg that comes goes across the bottom edge of the hammer comes around and hits that spring that this spring is going to be driven down. And as it's driven down on this end, it in turn is going to drive down on this end, forcing the action lock downwards. So the hammer coming around is what drives the action lock down and allows the slide then to be driven back by the action bars as the action lock is deactivated. Now, as the slide comes back, it's also going to push down on the connector and this deactivates the connector. It brings it out of its contact with the sear and at this point if the trigger was pulled the the trigger would pivot and come forward but then the connector here would hit this pin preventing it from coming all the way forward allowing it to pivot the sear out of contact with the hammer now currently we haven't actually locked the hammer back so that wouldn't really matter but this whole time the slide is holding down on the connector deactivating the trigger mechanism, and even when the sear is now locked underneath the notch in the hammer, keeping the hammer held back, if we were to pull the trigger now, that would not activate the sear. It's not until the slide comes back forward and is no longer driving the connector down that the connector can come back up and be in position where it can act upon the sear. And it's this spring here that is going to return the connector to its uppermost position. So as the connector is driven down, we can see it compresses the spring. And then once the slide comes back forward, this spring is going to drive the connector back up into its active position. To finish things off, let's talk about the operation of the shell lifter and the shell stops. Now the job of the shell lifter, as its name implies, is to lift shells that have entered into the action from the magazine tube up into alignment with the chamber so that when the bolt comes forward, the bolt can feed that shell into the chamber. Now, unlike the Remington 870, where the shell lifter was found at the bottom of the receiver and more or less formed a cover of the cutout on the bottom of the receiver, and although you could still come into the action and feed shells into the magazine tube, you would have to push the shell lifter up and out of the way, and you'd also have to resist the uh, spring tension of its return spring to do so. In the Mossberg 500, the shell lifter is just below the bolt and out of the way of any shells that would be fed into the magazine tube. It's not until the slide comes almost all the way back, the shell lifter is going to drop down, accept the shell from the magazine tube, and as the slide comes back forward, it will drive the shell lifter back up, allowing the bolt to feed that shell into the chamber. And let's go ahead and see that in action. So as the slide comes back, this sloped surface here on the slide will hit this angled surface here. This will pop the shell lifter up slightly and into a position to support the shell being extracted 
And as the slide comes back to the rear, eventually the shell lifter here is going to hit this fall off point. And a combination of gravity and then a double measure of this part of the slide coming back and hitting this angled surface ensures the shell lifter will be driven down. And you can see that happen now. And once the shell lifter is driven down like this, the shell is going to enter the action and sit on top of that shell lifter. At this point, the shell lifter is going to come up and what causes it to come up is the forward motion of the slide. This angled surface of the slide is going to ride along this slope, which in turn drives the shell lifter back up. The animation here is probably not the smoothest, but you get the idea. This brings the shell into alignment with the chamber, and then the bolt is going to drive it home. And then as we get towards the end of the motion, let's come a little bit out here in the x-ray, the shell lifter is going to be driven down slightly through gravity and riding underneath this cutout here is going to fall pretty much underneath the bolt and then be locked into place. At this point, the shell lifter can't go either up or down because the slide is keeping it held in the up position and the bolt is keeping it held down, so it can't really jiggle around too much. Whether or not you noticed it or not, this all is happening without any springs driving the mechanism. It's just a combination of gravity and uh, camming action of two subsurfaces riding along each other that drives the shell lifter. So very different from what we've seen in the past. As far as the shell stops are concerned, we're pretty much seeing more or less the same thing we've seen in the past. So we have two shell stops, one longer than the other. So this one here is longer, this one's shorter at this current moment. The one on the left is holding back the rim of the shell that's in the magazine tube, preventing it from entering the action. The longer one goes beyond the uh, rim, so it is not acting upon that shell. As we drive the slide towards the rear, we have a little bit of a different interaction here with this particular shell stop than we've seen in the past. So what's going to happen is the slide is going to come back and this bit of the slide is going to hit this slope surface here. It is going to drive the shell stop on this end down, which in turn drives this end up. This puts this shell stop in position to stop the shell, the, the next shell in the magazine from entering the action once we deactivate the other shell stop. So let's go ahead and take a look at the deactivation here. This is going to work just like what we saw on the Remington 870. We have a slope surface here on the action bar, which is eventually going to come back. It's going to strike the shell stop, which is going to drive the shell stop out and away from the rim of the shell, which is going to allow that shell to enter the action. And as we mentioned, this shell stop being in its upper position allows it to catch the next shell behind the shell that just entered the action, preventing it from coming into the action. The shell stop's going to be driven up. And at this point, the cutout in the action bar here has allowed the shorter shell stop to come back in its innermost position and ready to catch a shell so that when the action bar comes along and we hit this slope surface here on the shell stop, that's gonna drive the shell stop back down. And eventually it's gonna get at an angle where it no longer is gonna hold back the rim of the shell. This allows the shell to enter a little bit further into the action, but then it's gonna hit this shell stop here and then stop. So more or less the same kind of idea as what we saw in the Remington 870. It just executed very slightly differently, mostly on this end. The left side shell stop more or less works exactly the same way as the left side of the Remington 870, but it's this one on the right, the longer shell stop, that works a little bit differently. It works on more of a pivoting action rather than being forced outwards. But otherwise, same idea. And that is going to wrap up my look at the Mossberg 500 and for now the discussion of pump action firearms.
Through this series, we have seen three different designs of pump-action firearms, and I hope you have found the examination and comparison of these models enlightening, and that above all, you have enjoyed the video. This is Mouse Gunner, signing out.